to the ashes The spirits light up the night Looking down the edge of forever So stop me or take my advice Now, from the Untold Radio Network It's Untold Radio AM With Doug and Alex Hijack Hello, Hello, Mr. Alex. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> what was with the delay on the hello? <laughs> that was warming up. That was it. Huh? Okay. I told everybody you were in a silly mood. I really. was. Was? What do you mean, was? I still don't know. We'll, we'll find out if I still am. <laughs> okay. Anyhow. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, it's good evening. Um, tonight we have Alfred. Uh, I hope I pronounced his name Santa right. Santa Riga. Yeah. Santa Riga, yeah. so I was correct when I, I said that. It's, it's uh, the E is, a, the I is pronounced like an E. Yeah. Gotcha. And he's also known as the Squatch Father. <clears throat> Love it. Yeah. I like that name. I love it. But doesn't that kind of implies from out east? Don't you have to be from out east? Yeah, I, I, see what, I see what you're saying. With I, don't know. Like that. I don't know. I, I mean, he is from out east, isn't he? Isn't he? Possibly. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, have you been enjoying our extreme weather? It went from, what, 62 down to, what, five below last night? Yeah, Snow, that's great. It's a nice wind. roller coaster. Yeah, and it's just been, it's. I mean, we didn't get dumped on like they did out east. There's places there that got dumped, you know, two feet of snow. In, like, Chicago, they had hail and storm. They were kind of caught between the warm air and the cold air. So we got lucky here. We really did. I mean, it's cold, but we're not doing that. And I sent you a clip of both Chicago and then one from North Dakota. So play video one C. It's just crazy. So it's hail. Bye. Anyway. Crazy right now in Chicago. Hail is not normal, Alex, hey, in Chicago in February. No. Not in February. All right. Enough of that. Throw up um this one I sent you from North Dakota. And this is basically extremes from a 24-hour period. The guy was smart enough to film both. And he just he just go up and play it. Video two in. Monday, February 20th. Crank it up. In North Dakota. Sounds too low. Yeah. Tuesday. Oh. February 27th. All right, start that over again. North Dakota. Monday. February. So he's out there eating a popsicle. North Dakota. Enjoying the beautiful weather. People were wearing shorts and. Tuesday. <laughs> February 27th. I love his hat. North Dakota. <laughs> it's a crap show. Okay, that's enough of that. I get the idea. <clears throat> it's some big extremes. It really is. It's huge. Yeah. And <clears throat> last week, we had, wasn't it last week we were talking about a, a hamburger planet that looked like a hamburger? Correct? Yeah. Yeah, hamburger planet. I'm, I'm sure they have extreme weather on the hamburger planet, right? Probably, what, ketchup storms and who knows. But anyhow, have you ever heard of something, another new type of planet they discovered? And this one's called a jumbo Jumbo. A jumbo. A jumbo. So if you've, if you've never heard of this, a jumbo. What's a jumbo? Well, <laughs> okay. So apparently, it, it's obviously not the Disney cartoon. It's apparently a gassy kind of blob thing. Um, but they are they exist in pairs. So they're like twins. That's what they call a, a, a binary deal. It's a binary star. Or planet, binary planet. That's interesting. 
Yeah, but only normally they only find this with giant, massive stars that prefer these binary pairings. But they found these things. I mean, they're small, but they're still massive. So are they baby jumbos? No, they're jumbos. Go ahead and throw up the photo one. These are jumbos taken by the the uh, the web. Wow. Taken by the web and highly probably changed in Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah, the but baby jumbos. They never mention that. Is this like a real photo or is it doctored? Did they color it? Yeah, we don't know. They never NASA never mentions it. I think they should. But anyhow, so these are apparently um, big, blobby, and gassy, but they're new. It's something new they've never seen. Every week, something new with that damn James Webb telescope. Every week. It's going to be your picture they're going to see. <laughs> be the Alex star. <laughs> um, but anyhow, they don't know anything about them. They're cool looking. Very cool. Very cool. So now you know what a jumbo is. Do you remember the name of the last, the hamburger planet name? No. The, um, no. No, you don't. That's the one that you thought looked like something else? Yeah, it looked like, yeah. Somebody <laughs> said it looked like uh, somebody sitting on a toilet looking <laughs> up. And I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't even see that. I can't even hear it. <laughs> So, and last, it was last Thursday. It was right after our show. The next morning I woke, I woke up, um, a AJ, um, came over. She was freaked out because cell phones didn't work. Her GPS didn't work. She didn't know it was just like the big one, you know, the MP thing no. or whatever. And apparently maybe it was a big one. Um, because, you know, they're not going to tell you. at and not going to tell you anything, no, are they? they're not. I mean, I just, yeah, whatever. But apparently it was coincidental. There were two powerful, powerful, did I say powerful, power cis? What did oh, I say? I think so. There were two powerful solar yeah. flares. Yeah. Over that's, Wednesday and Thursday. That's when what we were saying. on the air. Yeah. yeah. And so apparently they were um, what they call an X 1.8 class flare okay and that occurred wednesday evening at 607 and then the next day they had a you know 1.7 and blah 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 blah. And then we got blasted by it so is this true the solar flares is that what wiped at and at&t out the phones you weren't you you weren't affected by it were you no different carrier yeah i have i was I was how long, how long were you out for? Oh, what? I don't know, until maybe noon. Noon. Yeah, enough to scare everybody. Yeah, that's a long time. To not so she, when GPS goes out, that's a little weird. I don't know why that went out, too. Um, and I'm not talking about, like, sending an Apple map. I'm talking about the GPS, like, in the car. Oh, the built-in wow. GPS. Could be getting the built-in one. Yeah, that's... I guess true GPS. Yeah. So who knows? Who knows? So I wouldn't rule out a CME knocking that mm -hmm. out, but I wouldn't rule out a hacker. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't rule out anything. I wouldn't rule out some dude unplugging the wrong cord. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't rule anything out, right? Yeah, exactly. But cellular phone service fizzled. And I I, I know they're offering people like a, a buck or some damn thing refund or some. Oh, no. Ridiculous. Said, I got some message. Probably even a scam. I should read it. <laughs> yeah. I should. I should look it up and read it. It was hilarious. I'm just like, oh, we care about you. And okay. Anyhow. Um, and then there was a fossil revealed. Um, it was a 240 mi million year old, of course, clickbait. They're calling it the dragon found in China. Throw up photo two. It is interesting. It's got one hell of a neck. It really does. You see this thing? Yeah. Oh, that's a neck, right? That is a neck. That's a neck. A and neck. I found it interesting they found this in China. So maybe it was this creature that caused the dragon legends. 
right? I'm sure it didn't yeah. breathe fire, but yeah, you want it to though, don't you, Alex? I so do. I you want, want it to breathe fire. Yeah, I know you're a big Game of Thrones. Yes, guy. Yeah. Anyhow, I thought, that was, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. So this thing is cool. 16 feet long, dates back 240 million years. It's been dubbed the dragon because of its extremely long neck. And it is a scientific name that I don't think I'd eat. Dino Cephalophysis Saurus Orientalis. Well, well, I have no idea. But anyhow. But it was found in the Orient in uh, in China, and it is pretty spectacular. A lot of detail there, it really is. You can damn near see what he ate for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, it's it is detailed. They were it's pretty right. cool. Captured a lot. Yeah. So apparently, some guy found that. That's what you just find. You just find it. <laughs> just walking around. Oh, look at this. Look at this tree. China's big, man. There's a lot of unexplored areas. I have no idea what happened to Alex, but I hope he comes back. So then there was a new anaconda species that apparently they say it's the largest ever. And this was um, discovered by a gentleman from the University of Queensland. And it is a giant anaconda. It's the green anaconda, the northern green anaconda. And apparently these things get up to 1,100 pounds, 24 feet long. As that is absolutely nuts. And apparently um, Will Smith is featured in some new National Geographic show, and it's a series called Pole to Pole with Will Smith. So apparently Will Smith is now an explorer. Um. I have no idea what happened to Alex. Let me see here if he's messaged me. Maybe we just got hit by another CME. I'm texting him. Let's see what happens here. That's interesting. Because unfortunately, Alex has, he's the one that can put all these awesome pictures up. <clears throat> there was another um, weird creature that was discovered in deep sea at 3,000 feet where sunlight is never seen um, in the tropical and subtropical waters. And um, apparently it's so far down, there haven't been many sightings, but there was a really beautiful photo taken. Photo 2 way. Hi, Alex. Hey. What happened? Did you get hit with a solar storm? No, I'll I'll tell you later. There's a there's a problem with their streaming service. Oh, nice. Anyhow, um, photo two A is a glass octopus. Check this dude out. So why is it transparent if nothing can see it? It's pitch dark down there, three thousand feet. So what does it matter what it looks like? Why would it be transparent? I don't know. Why Isn't is that a weird question? It is weird. Like, I mean, what's, it's, what's there's the point? no pigment. Look at that. Look at that side of its head. God knows what's in there. Look at that. I don't know. So these things only grow 18 inches long. Just not that small, really. They live two to five years. And that's their optic nerve and eye and digestive tract <clears throat> that's visible. That's it. That's all there is? That's it. Photo 3A, throw that one up <clears throat> before we lose you. This is cute, isn't it? Check this dude out. That is so it looks like a Pokemon creature. Yeah, something. it does. It doesn't even look real. No. This is um, found off the coast of Chile and Rapa Nui. Scientists spotted this. They call it a cute red bony uh, Shonacops. Huh. Bony Shonacops. Shonacops. Yeah. Look at his feet. So cute. He's got like hair on him. It looks like <laughs> hair. He is cute. He's got big eyes. 
So this was found in the Naz Chile's Nazca Marine Park. But they're rare. And then the private moon lander. Okay, this is so hilarious. The private moon lander, throw up photo three. The private moon lander, if you saw it before it landed, like there were pictures online. And it's this really upright, like long, like it's like my bottle of water. It's taller than it is wide, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself when I first saw it, that thing's going to tip over. Yep. What yep. do you think happened? It tipped over. Oh, no. And I'm like, yeah. why didn't you make it wide so it had a nice wide stance? You know? Anyhow, I just I thought it was funny. Well, you know, they say common sense isn't common. I guess not. I mean, I saw it right away and went, oh, I don't like the looks of that thing. It's going to tip over. Yeah. So um, it tipped over on its side. So it made, the, it made a landing. First one in more than 50 years. Signal was real weak. And it apparently tipped over on its side. And I thought it looked top heavy to me. Um, and let's see here with any other information. Probably not. Um, not really. I kind of covered it. I just wanted to. So it's called uh, the Odysseus was the name of the craft. That's it. No comments? No Alex comments? Oh, photo four does show it. Photo four. All right. Yeah, yeah, and you can see the legs. Yeah, they stick out, but this thing's really tall. Just looks really, and if it had any kind of payload, those legs aren't wide enough. No. Not for its height. You're going to want something double its own height for yeah. leg, leg width. I've actually built quite a few of these kind of landing tripods for um, underwater vehicles. Yeah, like the in fact, I built one that's still not deployed yet. It's at my condo. I'm waiting for the right moment to deploy it. It's all built, but it's got a nice. It's never going to tip over, right? Yeah, and it's going to go in the ocean. So anyhow, yeah, especially if you're landing on uneven ground. Exactly. Can... I mean, the moon doesn't look real smooth. I mean, no. there's cheese everywhere. Right? <laughs> All right, next thing, uh, photo five. So they're talking about building antimatter engines, right, that could fly human to other stars in just a few years. And right away I'm thinking antimatter, propulsion, great idea, what could go wrong? Yeah, what could go wrong? What could go wrong with antimatter when it hits any matter? It, yeah, yeah, no. Not, I don't know. I don't think that's the answer to safe travel. But it says antimatter engines could propel humanity into the next. Ooh, you know what I hear? I'm going to interrupt. I'm hearing Yvette again, third week in a row, taking out the garbage. Wow. So geez. I can get as spooked as I want tonight. <laughs> Okay. So we can go deep tonight. We can go deep. Oh yeah, yeah. We can have we can have Al just scare the crap out of me. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. So it says this is the ticket to interstellar travel. Um, antimatter particles come in contact with regular matter. It produces loads of energy. Yeah, exactly. That's why I don't I don't like the idea. What could go wrong with messing with antimatter, right? And that's uh, made up of particles that are almost like regular matter, but they're the opposite electrical charge. Oh, okay. Yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah real simple. Well, what could go wrong? Yeah, so apparently they annihilate each other. Oh. What, could go, what could go wrong if you annihilate each other? Nothing. Perfect. You there? What in the world happened here? What? You should have seen my screen. There was like a chimp just took over my whole screen. A chimpanzee. What? Yeah, there was a chimp took over my whole picture. I don't know what happened. So weird. Anyhow, yeah, it's kind of like do 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 do. And I wasn't touching anything, man. All right. Um, all right, we've covered that enough of that crap. Uh, the next thing is, um, 
I want to go to photo six quick because I've never seen a baby hyena. Oh, that's so cute. They're actually pretty damn cute. So I think the adults have something very awkward about the adults. They just, I can't, I get a weird vibe. They look evil. They look evil or something. I don't know what the deal is. But this thing's pretty cute looking. Yeah. It looks like a mini dog man. Yeah, a little dog man. Yeah, there you go. Little dog man. So if you want to fake a dog man, <laughs> some dog man footage, just use a baby hyena. I just say it's a baby dog man. No, no. Yeah, there it is. I just thought it was cute. All right, that's all I've got. It isn't much. You want to uh, do a... Uh, one 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 clip of some dad jokes. Yeah, that, that before we go a... into technological breakdown, I'm gonna talk about um some cool stuff tonight. So that's coming up next. We'll just cut to a couple of it's just it's one clip. It's got three dad jokes. Yeah, you it. you won't believe me. It's gone. They took it down. And the time you sent it to me, it's gone. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's fine. I know. That's no loss. Let's just go right to the technological breakdown. All right. Let's break it down. Hey, I re- I'm, I'm sorry. I cut, I cut you off there. What were you saying? No, do you always cut me off. Bumpers cut me off all the time. Tr- I'm so bad at this bumper stuff. I'm trying to time it right. It's fine. Okay. So anyhow, all so right. I want to talk about um yes. I want to talk about drones. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about some camouflaging cameras too, camouflaging cameras. But I want to talk about this sp- particular drone, and there's a reason why. <clears throat> I keep hearing people and I keep talking to people too that I know that buy a drone and never use it. They literally don't use it because it's a pain in the butt. It's too expensive. They get freaked out. They don't want to lose it. They want to break it, crash it, lose it. Yeah, they don't want to break it. It's just, it's a lot of work. Okay. This may be the answer. This is what I'm going to be buying for our next drone because of the following reasons. One, do you see the propellers are protected by guards? Yes, smart. Two. It's very small. You can literally, this thing is so rugged. You can crash it every day all you want. And people have been reporting for the last two years, doesn't even hardly have a scratch on it. They don't break props. The camera's also protected by two bumps that come out in the front. Um, The shoot's in, you know, almost 6K. Okay, so great footage. Uh, it's got a ton of features, which I'll mention. Um, one, it comes with, this is kind of important because it gives you the feeling you're in the drone, like you're a pilot, you're miniaturized, and you're looking, which gives you a lot more control. So you can put the goggles on, right? And then you can fly it with a number of other things. You can fly it with this, I guess, what is that, a joystick? Yeah, it looks like The thing with a trigger on it? Mm-hmm. The point is, you're looking through, you even have like an X that can guide you through obstacles. So you get you become very, very confident. And then if it gets out of range, of course, like a lot of drones do this, it comes home. Oh, nice. So it'll but this one, <clears throat> this one's not a problem landing it. Where so many drones, they come down and they have a, a obstacle avoidance. So you want to land it in your hand. And it won't land. And people get really frustrated and freaked out when it comes to landing drones. And so, like, like last time I flew a drone with Adam, you had to flip it upside down <laughs> to land it. Rotors downwards oh towards God. the ground. That's so weird. Because it didn't want to land. It wouldn't yeah. come down. Yeah. Because it's seeing the ground. The other thing, too, is a lot of drones, um, you know, with the exposed propellers, you can back them into objects, even though they may have collision avoidance. They don't in the back. And so if you're doing a backwards move, you can smash, like yeah. pull out, you can hit a tree. 
So that's something. This is not really that big of a problem. Yeah. The guard, the guard that snaps off, so you could could replace it if it ever breaks. But you can paint it fluorescent pink. So normally pulling out is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. But did you hear what I said? You can pull this guard off. Yeah. And paint it bright pink. Okay, bright pink. Because yeah. it has a find my drone button. Oh, so let's say cool. it does get lost off in a field yeah. or a whatever, far, far away. You can then plug your phone into the thing immediately, and it'll show you a map exactly where it is. And then when you get even somewhere near it, like even you know many, many yards away, there's a thing. You hit a button, and it starts beeping loud. So you can go in and find it, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to lose a $1,000 drone. And all in with extra batteries, you know, for extra flight time, which you're going to want to have, you're going to spend a grand on this all day long, right? The other thing I do like about this, it is compatible with other goggles, compatible with other types of controllers, other types of drones. So it's a really cool thing. Um, so it integrates with other... Oh, the other thing, this thing will hold. You can put a GoPro on top of it. So you can mount a GoPro on it, no problem. Oh, awesome to have for additional footage? Yeah, for additional footage. You could mount the camera aiming the other direction. Okay, yeah. You could have the camera for... aiming, you know, up or down, whatever. So you can get, yeah. So for like Bigfoot research, you could aim it below you Correct. or behind yep, you. Yep, 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 yep. And I just think that, you know, so many people are buying thermal, you know, like thermal drones, and but they're not using them. Because they're so expensive. I think it's a fear factor. They do that one flight and it scares a living. Chicken. Yeah. They smash into the side of their neighbor's house once and it's if over. Not, yeah, but if you're not going to use a drone, do not buy one. Yeah. It's a waste of money. You're better off going, you know, buying your girlfriend or wife a big present, right? Yeah. All right, um, let's see here. I made a few notes, things here, just to kind of get my brain going. Oh, they're super sturdy. Um, uh, crash them all you want, apparently. And, oh, you can set the altitude, right? Let's say you're in an area where all the trees are 50 foot. We'll set the altitude to 70 foot. And then lock right in there. You have horizon lock. You can lock on the horizon if you want. You have tons of manual features. You can set the, um, there's very few auto features, which actually I like. You go in and see, you look at your day and go, ah, oh, it's overcast. Well, then you can really dig into the shadows, right? And I recommend a drone like this. Don't go out on a sunny day <clears throat> that's windy. You're going to be disappointed. The wind's going to buffet any drone around, but especially a, a small one. But you get a nice cloudy day with flat lighting. Now you can really dig into those shadows in the forest, right? Yeah. You can kind of overexpose. Because we don't, look, if you're doing Bigfoot research, we don't give a crap what the trees look like. Yeah, we People don't. People don't think about that. They think, oh, I need really beautiful footage of the forest, right, to impress my friends. No, blow out those trees. Yeah. Overexpose them so you can dig into the shadows. So you can Isn't see that what you, big, you said? Yeah. You're doing. You said you're doing Bigfoot research, right? Yeah. yeah. We don't care about the trees. If you want to get scenic shots? Go ahead and get your scenic shots. Yeah, we're not doing B-roll. We're doing Bigfoot research. Right. Go get your B-roll separate. Don't worry about. It. But if you're actually doing research and searching an area, think about the shadows. Think about digging deep into them. You want to right? capture them? Yeah. No one's going to say, "Oh, that footage looks. Those trees look." Oh, no, 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 no. It defeats the whole purpose. Dig into the shadows. Yeah, dig into the shadows. So that's that's something I never hear from drone people that have drones and do research. Oh, we lost Alex again. Something's going on. Um, I'll keep going here. Hopefully yeah, we're still in the air. Okay. Um, let's see here. What else? Um, this is made by DJI. The drone that we have now lost the photo of it's called an aveda or also you could you could pronounce it avada so it's a dji avada so what happened we lost you again 
Uh, it says there's a bug with Chrome. It's a bug. Ooh, that's not good. Um, well, I don't know. Let's see. Okay, so go ahead and put that picture up again, if you can. Yeah, the drone. Yeah, if you can. Yeah, I can. No problem. So I will personally be buying this drone. Um, I wouldn't recommend anything otherwise. Um, if you have a drone you don't use, sell it while it's valuable because drones lose their value very quick. So if you do have one you don't use and you want to get one that you will use, this is a good choice because this thing is pretty, it's so easy. You don't need to even pack it back in the box and be all careful. Just throw it in your backpack. It's protected. Everything's protected on it. Put the lens cap on and throw it in your backpack. Yeah, I like the small size too, right? You're more yeah. less likely to crash into something. Well, yeah, that, that could be true. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, um, you know, yeah, if you're navigating really, through the trees, you yeah. know, you, you don't want a huge drone. Well, okay, a lot of people wonder about flight times. Flight times on this is 10 to 12 minutes. Obviously, <clears throat> if you've got a payload on it with a GoPro, or some other sports camera, it's going to, you know, decrease the flight yeah. time, right? Yeah. But you do have the hand control, you have the goggles, you, you get, uh, you can add an ND filter. Um, you can Indeed. crash it literally hundred times, hundreds of times without damage. People rate the durability of this drone 10 out of 10, which is really That's amazing. Perfect. Can you swap um, out the battery? Do you know? Like, if you want to, yo, yeah, 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 yeah. You, I recommend you buy extra batteries. I, I'm saying a thousand with extra batteries. Yeah, that's like two extra batteries. Right, because you want to do multiple flights. Yeah, some extra little accessories that you're gonna need. You know, you're gonna want. Um, you know, like a GoPro uh, Hero 11. You can mount on here. Okay, um, and it does have. Uh, you can put an ND32 or an ND64. Whether Obviously, you're going to want the 64 for outdoor shooting. Um, it says get a battery clamp or just get some gaffers tape, tape to hold the battery in while you're flying. So when you crash, if you crash, you don't damage the battery mounts. That's really one of the things people did complain about a little bit. They crash it into asphalt, the battery would fall out. Okay, so that secures it. Yeah, and so just a little ga gaffer's tape. Get a roll of gaffer's tape. And then just, and that leaves no residue. It's a real safe little tape to use. Yeah, perfect. Um, what else here? Uh, like I said, the manual things. Uh, you can change, you know, you can change it for really low light. Um, so the cons were... It's yeah, obviously no drone is immune to being lost or hung up in a tree. It's not good on windy days. I already mentioned that. Um, uh, there was a couple of people that mentioned a roll glitch. I think that's been fixed now. Those were old videos, old reviews, where it would just suddenly flip upside down and fall. Hmm. But I think that's been taken care of a long yeah. time ago. And that's really about it. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions in chat, but I don't think so. I don't really know. I don't even know if people care about drone information. I do. I think it's important, you know. <clears throat> this is one of the first drones I actually want to buy versus rent. Because normally I've been smart. I just rent them. Yeah, because you don't, you don't want to destroy it. You want to have someone. Well, I'm not going to use it. it. Past yeah. you know a certain time of year or, yeah. or a certain outing, I'm not you know it's just sitting there, yeah. rotting. And you just keep getting better the technology. Yeah, <clears throat> and this thing's been on the market two years, and it's still still good. So it's so it's proven. <clears throat> it's battle tested, man. Yeah, and I, that's the other thing you don't want to do: get a drone, it just comes out. <laughs> yeah, you want a battle tested one. Nope, nope, nope. So anyhow, bottom line is get something you're going to use. You're going to enjoy. And then strategies for drone. Go into an area. Look on Google Maps first. Let's say you want to explore a power line cut, right? Well, to find the power line cut, get there, go in there, and blast this drone down that power line cut. Just blast it down there as fast as you can go because that's how you're going to bust something. It's going to be by the element of surprise. They don't. They don't see it coming. So if you see it, let's say you see an open area in the forest. You see it on Google's Google Maps. 
there's a pond there. There's a stream. Oh, this could be good Squatch habitat. Once again, show up, blast that drone in. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you know where the the likely territory is based off of the water and the power line cut. So Will Star uh, Monsters and Mysteries, he was a friend. He said this has the same tech in this drone, I think, that they use in some racing drones. Yeah. Yep, okay. Anyhow, so that's my strategies for drone and take it for what it's worth. I'm entertainment purposes only, right? Yeah. That's the excuse for everything now. (laughs) <laughs> right. So the next thing I want to talk about is if you own regular standard camera traps, they're not cheap, man. And well, I know guys, I got 20 of them. I've got a bunch of them. Yeah, I've got a bunch of money invested in browning camera traps. But you do research with them. You're not having, you get a lot of wildlife, but you know, and they are great. These camera traps are all amazing. They all get better and better every year. They do get a little bit smaller. Um, What I don't like about the modern ones is they always are putting double like passive sensors, double lenses. That's kind of a common thing. And they look like eyes. Yeah. So do a little research and maybe you can patch off one of those eyes to give it more, uh, less symmetry, right? Because symmetry is what catches any animal's eye, Mm -hmm. including humans. We notice symmetry. So, I want you to throw up um, a photo seven. Let's just, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Okay, so this is a product. It's available through Metro Autographics is is one company. And I invented this product. It's a photo reel camouflage wrap for cameras. Now, the reason it's the only, it was at the time I invented it. I think there's been some copycats since. But it's the only bark photo reel wrap that you can get. And people go, well, I'm not good at doing that. No, the more wrinkly and the worse job you do, the more realistic it'll look. Right? Yeah. The more wrinkles and lines. And I'm, you know, I put it on too, too um, perfect for this photo. Plus, you don't need the whole sensor showing. Do you see how I made straight edges on it? where I cut this, we're on the middle yeah. sensor. You'd be better off and better equipped to make it all jagged, right? Icky oh. around the lenses. Yeah. We don't care. Once again, quit thinking about quality. Go jagged with the wrap around your lenses to break up this perfect circle, right? You want it to look natural. So you can cut little pieces out and you just like put them all over. You can you try to break the whole outline of. So, and I don't have an example because, you know, this was made for a company. Um, I invented this out of need, but it's made and it sells, um, you know, for, so um, people don't find them too. Keeps people from stealing your From cameras, stealing the tracks. Your, your, yeah. camera, your trail cameras. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah. And this comes in a huge variety of, I don't know, how many flavors does this come in? Like you can pick out your tree bark from your area and match it exactly. Can you blow up the photo so we can see like the different? There's a few examples there. Yeah. Or just click the arrow over, you know, to show us more photos. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me let me pull it up. So. So and you can see I named it Sasquatch Camera Trap Wrap. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot. There's pretty much. But yeah, it's very specific for the bark, which is very important. But I recommend you put it on really ugly and really rugged. Yes, you can peel it off again. Will it peel off? Hell no, without help. I think it's a brilliant product. So, anyhow. I mean, if you're going to go out and do all this stuff and research, you might as well do it right. This is just one more thing you can do. Paint stinks. Um, and throw up. Um, oh, what I want you to do, Alex, go back to that photo, the main photo. Yeah. I want you to sure. blow it up really big. You're talking about uh, this one? Yeah. Blow that up really big. And if Al's in the back, we can bring Alan. 
Um, he's uh, he should be here in five minutes. Oh, okay. Blow that up even bigger. Keep going as big as you can get that. All right, that's good. But you can see the more wrinkles you can see a few wrinkles there. The more yeah. wrinkles you put in it, the better. And you can you know just cut it in little pieces and stick it on there, and you can peel it off your camera and be actually protected. And it'll look like bark, right? Yeah, Apparently. and then throw up photo seven A. I don't not mean to put this company down, but this is the typical paint job. Right. Yeah. And that may yeah. be good on one particular type of tree. Birch is my favorite because white on white, it's just, uh, it's less noticeable. Birch bark. This birch bark tends to be peeling all over anyhow. Mm -hmm. So it's I recommend noticeable. the birch. It's my, my choice. Yeah. yeah oh, that makes sense. By the way, I have one here. So this is, they, how they come in a package like this. This happens to be, uh, if I can read with these, white pine. So this is white pine. It's enough to do any any uh, trail camera and more. Probably get two out of it. All right. I think that's about all I have on technical on technological breakdown. I think we're done. All right, on to Doug's clips. Yeah, so um, clip one. Should I uh, hit the bumper? Oh, yeah, you and your bumpers. Go ahead. Please <laughs> yes. put the bumper on. Thank you. Good job running the bumper. All right, I did a good job. You gave me a little warning. I yeah, know. I know, right? Okay, so clip one, no sound. This is just a really fun, and who the hell knows if these clips are true? <clears throat> it's kind of a compilation. Or is it BS? Is it real? Is it? It is a bit creepy for, you know, it's, it's one of my untold Doug's favorites for this week. But go ahead and play it. No, the sound is not needed. But is this from the future? You see champion? Is this a champions? Well, this guy looks like Abe Lincoln. <laughs> it said champions 2026. So the whole theme of this video is this. See the iPhone there? Yeah, I see it. It's got Mike. Is that Mike Tyson? Yeah, I think so. So they, did, they didn't exist then. Prime. Oh, yeah. Energy what? drink. So the whole the whole theme of each one of these clips is time travel. And that one is just kind of a shadowy yeah, dude. Like a ghosty type. It's weird. So once again, I don't know if any of this stuff's fake. Probably is. That's good. It's cool though. It's funny, it's a cool clip. Um, clip two, uh, sound is good. These are these weird sounds in the sky are back. And this is in Colorado. Once again, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's legit. Take it for what it's worth. If you live in Colorado and you've heard these, please let us know in the comments, whether it's tonight, tomorrow, a year from now. Let us know. Is this legit? Did you hear this? Go ahead and play it. Listen. Is that allows so you can go. Let's see here. Yeah. What the fuck is that? Oh. Oh, I was gonna warn you about the language. <laughs> oh, really? Forgot about warning you. She's got a potty mouth. But... Please let me guys hear this. I don't blame her though. Wait for it. Yeah, I don't blame her either. Can you hear? I can't really even hear anything. Let me turn my volume up. I don't hear anything. Um. 
Are you sure that are you sure your computer isn't muffling these things? No, it's not muffling. Uh huh. <laughs> There we go. Let's go ahead and put it from the beginning, though. Listen. Whoa. Stay inside, baby. Well, that'd be well, good. That's that's enough. It, it's one of the weirder sounds I've heard. And we're back. I'm back too. What happened? Same error. Uh, there's a problem with StreamYard and Chrome. Send you the error message later. Uh, nothing I can really do. Um, Alfred. This is, is all. Here. Oh, by the way, this has all been happening since they updated their software, correct? Y yeah, yeah. This is what I hate about that. It's. Drives me nuts about all these companies. They they get a good product solid, then they update it. They don't beta test it. They need to beta test this stuff more. So yeah, yeah it's irritating. So, but since I've been coming in, we should probably get Alfred on. He's in the back room. Oh yeah, yeah. let's get him on. Hey Al. Hey uh, Alex. Hey Doug. Thank hey, you for having me. Doing? That was the longest pregnant pause ever, Al. <laughs> now something came up on my screen and you guys oh, were distracting you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we're having a few glitches tonight. Apparently, um, our streaming software has updated and it's just full of bugs. So they need to get their buck, uh, their their act together. <clears throat> Anyhow, it's good to have you on. Um, uh, it's good to be here. We were just about done with a couple of clips. Um, let's just do, let's go to clip six, Alex. No, no, sorry. Clip five. This is a real life sound is good. That's a real life Dorothy experience. Maybe you can identify what this is, Al. I can't. I, my brain cannot figure out what in the world fell out of the sky. Okay. Now there's a sign that says Samsung, but do it and play this. Sound is good. Never know what's going to happen. This baby fell out of the sky and landed in our yard. It's never boring on the Welke farm. Thank God there's no horses out or it didn't hit the house. So, I mean, it's got like landing gear Still on going it. going and flashing. It's got lights on it, satellite. It's like a satellite dish that's on a balloon. That's the deal. <laughs> So yeah, what do you think that right. is? That wouldn't yeah, be for weather. I have no idea. Why would Samsung have a weather balloon up? I don't know. Yeah, it's just kind of weird. I think we're getting, uh, I think there's a lot of spy balloons floating over the U.S. right now is what I think. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. That one could have passed that. And then clip six, last one, real quick. Um, uh, no sound. It's not needed. So what are the chances of a cow? Okay, you're in a tent, Al. And this cow, see the shoes sitting there? You see the shoes and laying there? You take yeah, them yeah, off before yeah, you go yeah, in the yeah. tent. Watch this cow. <laughs> <laughs> and then it catches the other one and walks off with this guy. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that is that is funny. Yeah. Oh man, that is hysterical. Anyhow, that's it. That's all I've got. Okay. It's, it's all <laughs> you was, and all. That was great. <laughs> it's all it's at this point it's all you. So um so Al is um he, they know you. How many people they call you the Squatch Father? Yeah, you could thank Chris Reinhardt for that. Oh, Absolutely. he named yeah, you. He, he gave me, he, he nicknamed me the Squatch Father. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, you need to, you need to nickname him. Um, <laughs> well, you nicknamed him the OG. So. I know. Yeah, I was so. teasing him one day. Okay. Uh, it says here um, uh, that you're the uh, uh, director of the New York State Sasquatch organization. Is that yeah. still current? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. So, um, any obviously you're into you're into Bigfoot. Is that your favorite topic? Bigfoot? Um, honestly, I can't really pick my favorite topic. I lo- I like them all. I love I love. I mean, I've always been a Bigfooter, you know, my whole life. And uh, but I come from a paranormal family, so the paranormal was right there. They went neck and neck, and and even the UFO stuff. I mean. First UFO sighting at 10. My mother was a psychic there. We had all kinds of, see, my first ghost at five. Yeah, uh, so you, okay, so, well, you grew up with an open mind. Yeah, and I first asked watch at 12. So, you know, I mean, um, to me, paranormal was just normal in my yeah. family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about this um, sighting. sighting when you were 12. Yeah, it was... Um, so South, tell me, well, tell me where you were, how it all happened. And- okay, I was 12 years old. Um, every summer, my father would send me and my cousin Anthony, who was 15. We would go down to my sister's house in South Florida. And um, that was our summer camp. And my brother-in-law had a, had a restaurant down in a little town called Davy. He was an ex-Marine and, um, you know, he would have work for us in the morning. And then after it, afternoon, it would get too hot and we would either be in the pool the rest of the day or we would ride our uh, dirt bikes out in the swamp and stuff. So, you know, every year we went down here. So we knew a lot of the kids in the neighborhood. It was one uh, it was a two mile square. This neighborhood was um, with um uh, swamps that the Everglades, the Everglades surrounding it, you know, canals. Okay, so, canals so there's okay, well, let me interrupt you. Yes. So, there's there's swamps, are there creeks and streams? Uh, not areas? creeks and streams, uh, canals, a lot of canals, canals. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah, keep going. And, um, yeah, so you know, we were, we were, um, you know, at one point, my sister had a, had a house in the beginning of the development. And it was just like one lane bridge that went over from the main road to this development. It's called Sunshine Acres. And then she moved, that was, we called it the greenhouse. And then she moved up the up to the back of the development to the blue house. And the blue house was the newer one and it just had the, it had the pool. And um, so we were, you know, we would go down there every summer. We knew all the, all the guys in the neighborhood and um, we would hang out in the swamp and we would go, we have bonfires and we'd go shooting in the swamp. And um, one of the kids in the neighborhood, his father had a horse ranch and we would take tours out in the swamp. You know, we, we shoveled crap in, in the, in the, in the barns to make a few extra dollars so we can get some, you know, drinking money, you know? And uh, so, you know, one night my cousin Anthony and I were hanging out and um, we're watching uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert. (laughs) It's like one o'clock in the morning. Remember those uh, days? Remember those days, right? And uh, I know I'm dating myself, but um, one o'clock in the morning and she had two uh, really um, large bone German shepherds. They were canine dogs. And um, the house was fenced in from the, the sides all the way around the back. The front had a circular driveway with a fountain that, that didn't have any fence on it. And um, we slept in the sunroom. It was like a pullout couch with a giant picture window in front of us. It was like a eight by four window. And one night we we're going to bed after after the Don Curse's Rock concert, and. Uh, 
we felt a horrible smell go by the house, just brutal. And the dogs went absolutely insane. And um, I grabbed the dogs and dragged them into the garage because uh, if they would have woke up my brother-in-law, everybody would have got a beaten that night, you know. And, can, you, uh, can you describe the uh, smell, uh, Al? Yeah, it's the hardest smell to describe. I described it like a thousand skunks to me. You know what I mean? It's a really, really unique scent that's hard to put a label on. Some people say it smells like sweat dog. Other people say it smells like urine or feces. To me, I would describe it like a thousand skunks. It's a very powerful smell. Um, so, you know, this happens. We go to sleep, wake up in the morning, we're having breakfast, and we tell my brother-in-law and my sister that, you know, something went by the house last night that stunk to high heaven, and um, the dogs went crazy. You had to put them in the garage. And my brother says, oh, it must have been the skunk ape. You know, my cousin and auntie and I just looked at each other and we started laughing like, yeah, skunk ape, what, what's the skunk ape, you know? And... Um, they went on to explain it was like the Florida version of Bigfoot. Now, I seen the Patty video when I was a kid with all my cousins. We all lived in the same neighborhood. We were out of watching James Bond or something, and it came on after Bond or it came on before Bond. And I remember seeing that Patty video and turning to my cousins and saying, that's real. That's a real Bigfoot. And I, I just, from the moment I seen it, I said, that's real. So when, you know, they described it, it was the Florida version of Bigfoot. We were a little taken back because we thought Bigfoot was only in the Pacific Northwest, you know. Nobody knew it was all over the country at that point in time. At least we didn't. And um, so that just led to the second time it came around again. It was like a Friday. Well, 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 okay, before you tell us about the second time, Al, can you kind of give us a better description of this thing? What you saw exactly? Well, see that see that first time I didn't see it. We just smelt it. Oh, so I, I okay. Didn't get, I didn't get eyes on it. Oh, I got you. Time. Okay. We didn't know. We didn't know what the smell was. The, like I said, the dogs were going crazy. We wanted to get the dogs into the garage so we okay. wake my brother-in-law up. So we didn't get eyes on it the first time. Okay. So the following can, can, week. Okay, yeah, I got I'm you. Sorry. So the following week again. It were, it's, we were watching wrestling or something and we go to bed late, you know, and uh, we're, we're laying in bed and um, the sensor lights went on in the front of the house. And when the sensor lights went on in the front of the house, we seen this giant shadow cross in front of us. And we were like, whoa, what's that? You know? And the dogs, again, the dogs went a ballistic immediately. And I jumped out of bed and I grabbed them and dragged them into the garage. But when I came back to the, the sunroom, I did like a belly crawl to the window because we had this giant picture window in front of us. And I opened up the shade and just peeked out like one eyeball because I didn't know what I was looking at. And there standing in the middle of the driveway, looking at the picture window. Now, I thought hindsight being 2020 i thought it was looking at me but you know it must have seen its reflection in the glass because it did this like incredible hulk kind of scream and flex and when it screamed it just went right through you and my cousin anthony was like paralyzed in the bed he couldn't move and i i was sitting there like you know my mouth i was like oh my god I'm looking at this thing. It's humongous. It looks like King Kong to me, you know? And it's got red eyes. It's black, but it has like a red highlight or tint to the, to the hair, you know? It's got canines. Its shoulders are humongous. I mean, humongous this thing was. And it starts to walk over to the left side of the house. Um, that side of the house, we had an empty lot, and there was a lot of um, wild watermelons in it. I grabbed my cousin Anthony, and I dragged him out of bed, and I said, come on, come on, come on, let's go see. Because I knew there was a bathroom in between the kids' rooms that faced that side of the, the property. And we went in the bathroom, and we left the light off, 
the windows were tinted that had a tinted screen and we're standing in the bathtub looking at this thing as it's walking by the fence. Now, the way I got its height, um, and I always say it was about nine feet, 12,000 pounds. The way I got its height was that the fence that went around the back of the house was six foot and this thing was head and shoulders above the fence, you know, mm. <clears throat> and it's walking and it's looking at us. Like it can see us looking at it. I mean, so much to the to the point where we would duck down underneath the window, count to 10 and pop back up and it would still be looking at us. Although it was walking towards the back of the property, at one point it stopped, reached down and grabbed a wild watermelon. And in one bite, it just like devoured this watermelon and just threw like the two nubs on the floor. And it started to head towards the back of the property. Again, I grabbed my cousin Anthony and I said, come on, let's go out to the patio. Patio is fenced in. And I knew the minute it got past the back of the patio, the sensor lights in the back would go on. So we get back there and we're waiting and uh, it passes us and sensor lights go on and it's walking towards the back of our property. And again, as it's walking, it's looking back like it's looking at us. It can see us. It looks like it can see as clear as day. The, um, the house behind our home had a man-made lake. Squatted down with one hand, scooped up the water, drank the water out of the man-made lake. And then it headed off on a 45 degree angle towards the swamp where we rode our dirt bikes and had our bonfires and stuff like that. And when it got into the swamp, it just started screaming to high heaven. I mean, it just, it went off. It went mm -hmm. off. And, um, wow. and you know, so we were like freaking out. And like, oh my God, you know, we, we we're down here from New York City and we're going to get killed by this monster. You know, it's bad enough we got to deal with, you know, thugs in, the, in, the, in our neighborhoods, you know. Now we got to come down here and get killed by a monster. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, the next morning, we tell we tell my brother-in-law again, and he says, yeah, that was the skunk ape, you know. That's, we went around to that. My brother-in-law said, let's go see if it left any footprints in the sand. And we went around, and there was 18-inch footprints in the sand. They were 18 inches long and about 9 inches wide. And he says, I'm going to come home from at lunchtime from the restaurant. I want to cast them. He wanted to make casts. He wanted to put two on the bar in the house and two in the restaurant as a conversation piece, you know? Um, but the restaurant got busy. He never came home. The horse rancher was doing tours that day, and they always went past our house, right where that watermelon field was, and they destroyed all the footprints. So by the time he got home at night, there was no footprints left. Wow. And um, so that's how it started. You know, we went, and I'm talking to all the guys in the neighborhood, you know, and we had been down there year after year after year, but that particular summer, it was there was a heat wave, there was a drought, there were fires in the Everglades, and it was pushing a lot of creatures inland, you know? And um, we were seeing reports of skunk, skunk apes all over the news. They were like, they were talking to, um, state troopers and county troopers and town police and it would be on the radio it would be in the newspapers it would be on tv so you know we knew this thing was real you know we talked to the our friends in the neighborhood and they would say yeah when it's hot like this um these things come out you know and uh so we were like okay you know obviously these things are real we've seen it and then um one night we were again we were, um, Cousin Anthony were hanging out. It was late. Um, mm -hmm. My brother-in-law came home from the restaurant around 12, 1230 or something like that. And what he used to do is he used to bring home all the pizzas that got burnt during the course of the night. And we would eat them like midnight snacks or have them for lunch, you know. So we were out in the patio eating these burnt pizzas because you know, being from New York, we like our pizzas well done. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we like our pizzas well done, you know. And uh, we're sitting out in the back patio and my sister is up and my brother-in-law is up. We're all talking. When we hear what sounds like a 30-30 going off, bang, 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 lever action gun. So we run to the front of the house and from our, our house was, we had a direct line of sight to the 
horse rancher's property. And you can see the muzzle flash going off. Boom, boom, boom. So he says, jump on your dirt bikes, go over and see what's going on. So my cousin Anthony and I would jump on our dirt bikes and we ride across, we ride across everybody's lawn to get there as fast as we possibly can. And we get there and all the neighbors are out. Everybody's out because of the gun firing. And um, our friend comes out and we're talking to our friend. They're like, hey, man, what's going on, you know? And he goes on to explain to us that his father had just brought in a wild Mustang from Wyoming or Montana or somewhere. And he had it out in the corral. Couldn't put it in the stall at night because it would kick and it made all the other horses nervous. So he had it in the corral. And he had a seminal Indian coming every day to work to try to break the horse. But that particular night, he had that horse out in the corral. And apparently, this nine-foot skunk ape snuck up on the horse and grabbed the horse from what is hind by its hind quarters. And according to the Native American, the horse must have kicked out and kicked the skunk ape. And when the skunk ape let go, the horse jumped over the corral and ran into the pasture. Uh, once it got into the pasture, I guess the skunk ape couldn't catch it anymore. At that point, the rancher was out and he was shooting at the skunk ape. He seen wow. the skunk ape and his property went right into like the Everglades. We were right on the outskirts of the Everglades, okay? And his property went right. So this creature ran off into the swamp. Um, the cops came, the sheriff, local sheriff came, and he gave the sheriff a report. And, uh, and the sheriff said, okay, you know, we'll come back in the morning and we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a walk around. We'll get the horses or whatever. We'll, we'll see what's going on. They came back in the morning and the Seminole Indian rode out to the pasture on another horse, got the wild Mustang, brought it back to the, to the corral. And when he did, the horse had handprints on its hind quarters. Like if I was to grab you by your wrist and squeeze as hard as I can, and you leave that indentation, yep, well, that's it. what it that's what it had on its hind quarters. Not claw marks, not finger marks. I saw I saw a coyote once. Okay, we had rolled through rolled uh, rode horses down a trail. Okay, came back later, and there's a we had rode through this terrible stink. Okay. Much like you describe, it was horrible. I mean, it was overpowering. We had to put yes. our clothes over our face. We ride through this trail for the second time. There was no stink last time. And now there's a coyote laying in the trail awake, but he's paralyzed. Oh, wow. He's got huge handprints embedded into his um, hair or his fur. And it looked like something broke his spine. Oh, wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that so when you're telling me about the handprints on the horse, I kind of get shivers because I think I've seen Bigfoot handprints in an animal. Wow. And man, it's something. Yeah, no, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, to see like handprints, two of them perfectly on the back of this horse's oh, hind quarters. You know, and of course, Keep going. you know. The sheriff, the the, the the horse ranch is, you know, going crazy because his prize uh, uh, Mustang or whatever it was has it's got this, you know, hot damage to it now, you know. And so the sheriff says, OK, we'll pick up the patrols in the neighborhood. You know, you guys are on the outskirts of town and, you know, right on the cusp of the Everglades. And you have a lot of sightings. We were surrounded by canals. I mean, we did, on all four sides yeah. of us, there was canals. And um so a couple of weeks go by and it's been pretty quiet. And um, my brother-in-law and my sister go out one night. They're meeting friends from New York are coming in and they're taking them to, I don't know if they're going to Miami or Fort Lauderdale or whatever. They're going out for dinner and dancing and all. And my cousin Anthony and I were taking care of the kids, babysitting the kids. And um, they get back to the house around two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, my sister, you know, the dogs go crazy as soon as the car pulls into the driveway. So you got to let the dogs out. Sister gets out of the car. My brother gets out of the car and he's like, um, any action tonight? You know, and we're like, uh, no, a pretty quiet night. No sooner than we say that. No sooner than we say that. We hear a blood curdling scream. I mean, it was horrific screams. Nobody knew what we were listening 
to. It was so, so it just made chills go down your body. My sister freaked out and she ran into the house with the dogs. And right after we heard that scream, um, the cattle ranch who lived directly up the road from us, you see like a double bower shotgun go off. Boom, you know? And my brother says, jump in the car. Let's go see what's going on, you know? So we jump in. He had a brand new Lincoln Continental, like Mark IV. All right, Al, Al, Al. Just hang on a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. You heard a what? A blood-curling you... scream? You know, we heard that. I heard you say that, but what okay. else did you hear? A double-barrel shotgun. Oh, a double-barrel. Another one. Well, the first one was more like a lever action 30 Okay, okay. Like bang, so this, bang, bang. So this, this latest like, one, now you're boom. hearing... A shotgun going off. Yeah, but it was and, definitely a double barrel. Double barrel. Both, okay, go both, ahead. Uh, you know, you can see both barrels light up, you know, in okay. the night. And um, so we jump in my brother-in-law's car. My cousin Anthony grabs shotgun. I'm in the back seat. I tell my brother-in-law to open up the sunroof. I'm hanging out the sunroof. And we, we, we drive up the street. And as we get to our block, we have to make a left. And just as we get there, no, we have to make a right. As just as we get there, the deputy is passing us. They're doing a patrol now on the neighborhood. And we can see a car at the far end of the development. Uh, another car with headlights turning the corner down there. We get stuck behind the deputy, and we're doing like two miles an hour. And we're sitting behind the deputy, following the deputy. And uh, the deputy's got his spotlight to the left because he's looking towards where the, where the swamp is, you know? And as he, everybody is looking left where the spotlight is, this creature comes running out of the darkness from our right. And the deputy's police car hits it. Okay, stop, the, stop right there. Okay, what time of night is this? Two o'clock in the morning. Okay, so it's really late. Yeah. And so the deputy, this thing rushes out from what side? Left, right? It was on the right side. It came out of the darkness on our right. Yeah, and nobody seen it because everybody was looking to the left because that's where he had his spotlight. And are, are you are you boys on your dirt bikes? No, no, we're in my we're in my brother in law's uh, Lincoln Continental. Oh, okay. And I'm hanging out of the sunroof because I want to get a good view right. of what's yeah, going yeah. on. And yeah. my cousin's got a shotgun. He's older than me. He grabbed shotgun. You know, I'm he a little slow him. tonight, Al. I'm having a hard time keeping up with you. That's fine. <laughs> Oh uh, no, no. I mean, it's nothing you're absolutely. doing. I'm just I'm just I don't know what's wrong with me. Anyhow, so pick it up. This thing comes rushing out and it runs out of the darkness from our right. The deputy's police car hits it. Jeez. When he hits this thing, the police car stops like he hit an oak tree, right? <laughs> this thing we my brother law jams on the brakes. Um, this thing falls back and takes down like a school crossing sign or a school bus sign that's supposed to be like unbendable up to 250 mile an hour winds, right? From the hurricanes and stuff. Well, when it hits this sign, it pancakes this sign. It just flattens it, okay? It gets back up, and this is like happening in slow motion now, okay? Um, it's surreal, and he gets back up and then walks over to the deputy's police car. My brother-in-law hits it with the high beams. Because everybody wants to get a good look at it, right? And it walks over to the police car. We can see the deputy with his hands on the steering wheel. You know, we see a silhouette. And then right next to him is his shotgun. Because back then they carried him in the front of the car, not in the trunk. Um, and uh, it leans over. And it does like a hammer punch on the front of this police car. And it screams at the deputy, just looks dead at him and screams at him. And when it hits the front of this police car, the back of it comes off the ground. That's how hard he hit it. Look at the look, Al. Take five seconds. Look at Alex's face. Yeah, I'm looking at Alex's face. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at it, yeah. And um, so at this point, where everybody's sitting there, um, it limps off into the swamp. Now, the car at the far end of the block puts its lights on. Obviously, it's the sheriff. He puts his lights on. He comes racing towards us. He's like, he sees the police car dead in the water in the middle of the road. 
and he's taking the deputy sher uh, sheriff's statement. And he's saying, well, why don't you take the shotgun out and shoot this thing? And the deputy's like, the shotgun wasn't big enough. You know, the shotgun just wasn't big enough. And he's taking our statement. You know, I don't know if it's for the insurance policy, but, you know, everybody's taking everybody's statement. At this point, the cattle rancher comes racing up in his pickup truck. And he says, Sheriff, you got to come back to my ranch and see what that damn skunk ape did to my prize bull. Now, this the, the story, okay, just slow down. Al, you're taking it. This incredible story. You act like you're rushing through it. <laughs> the story can't get any better, can it, Al? No, nah, it's just in my <laughs> adrenaline when I tell the story. <laughs> I know, I but. I feel like I'm reliving it in my I, adrenaline. I get it. Like I get it. This, yeah. a, this is crazy. But just when you thought it wasn't going to get any weirder, it continues to get weird. Do you get do you get flashbacks when you're going through it? Like, do you do you relive it? I relive it every time I tell it. Absolutely, I see it all happening again in my it, mind. Is, is that why you're you're blowing through it? Like, it's am I really going too fast? <laughs> do I need to slow down? <laughs> yeah, slow it down, Al. <laughs> sorry, this is set the scene, mind. breathe in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take my a breath, Al. Take a breath. My, my adrenaline. <laughs> There's no rush. Take a breath. It's like There's, I'm there. And I want to hear it more. It's not behind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not behind you. Exactly. So, all right. So, at this point, the sheriff, the deputy, roll, the sheriff rolls up on us. The cattle rancher rolls up and he says, um, "Sheriff, you got to come back to my my ranch and see what the, this creature did to my prize bull." Now, this guy, he had a white Brahma bull. Okay, with the hump in its back, and this thing was the size of a minivan. If it was 2,500 pounds, it weighed an ounce. Now, me personally, I knew how big the bull was because I had a face to face encounter with it. I used to jog the two miles around the development every day after, you know, after we worked out, my cousin and I would work out. And I was more into the martial arts than the heavy lifting, so I would jog. And there was a lady who lived down the street from us who had um, a St. Bernard. It was like Cujo. And every time I would run by its house, it would jump up on the fence and go crazy and try to kill me. And one particular day, I'm jogging by there, and the woman is coming home up the street in her car, and she hits the automatic opener to the fence, to the gate, the gate opens up and the dog comes charging out after me and I'm running for my life. And down in Florida, this development, there were no trees. There wasn't even any palm trees to try to shimmy up. It was just flat and grass and I'm running and the dog is gaining on me. And the only place I had to go to get away from the dog was over this little four foot fence into the pasture with the cows and the Brahma bull. So I said, okay, I wasn't going to get mauled by Cujo. So I dove over the fence. I ended up on the other side of the pasture. When I looked up, I seen the, the bull look at me and start walking towards me. I started moving along the fence line behind the cows. I was using like the cows as protection. At that point, the dog jumps up on the fence and starts barking. And now the bull's attention is drawn to the dog. And while the bull is dealing with the dog, I'm trying to work my way out the side gate. So I know how big this bull was. This bull was like a minivan. He was huge, okay? And at this point, the lady's calling the dog back down the street. The dog comes back down the street. I get out of the pasture without getting, you know, killed by the bull. And so when the when the cattle rancher says, you got to see what this thing did to my prize bull, in my brain, I couldn't comprehend this thing doing anything to that bull because this bull was a monster himself, you know? And uh, so my brother-in-law says, okay, let's leave this area. We go around the deputy's car because the deputy's car is dead in the water. It's not going anywhere. We go around the deputy's car and we follow the sheriff and the cattle rancher back to his place. We get back to his property and... Um, he, the sheriff is panning the pasture, and there in the middle of the pasture is this white Brahma bull 
bleeding out with no head. It's got no head. A Brahma ball. Those things are massive. Massive. And they're mean, too. They're mean bulls, okay? And um, and I know that because the town we were living in, Davie, the biggest thing that this town had, it was a dirt town. It was no sidewalks. The biggest thing was the rodeo on the 4th of July. So we would go to the rodeo every year. We seen the bulls, you know what I mean? Jeez. And everybody would say the Brahma bulls are like the, the meanest, nastiest ones. And so it's bleeding out, and I'm... And disbelief. I can't believe this bull is bleeding out. And uh, so the dep- the sheriff is panning the rest of the pasture. And like 100 yards away at the other end of the pasture is the head. This creature just ripped the head off of this bull and then just threw the head away. Now, the only thing I could think of... Okay, good night, um, everybody. <laughs> the only thing I could think of was maybe... That creature was in the pasture to get a calf or something, you know, and the bull seen it and attacked it and, you know, made the best man win. And at that point, this cattle rancher was going absolutely nuts because this bull must have cost him a fortune. And um, so, the, so the sheriff said, OK, you know what, we're going to I'm going to call in back up. We're going to we're going to find this creature tonight and we're going to kill it, you know. And um, they called in the state police, the county police. They came in with dogs. They came in with horses. They came in with helicopters. And they searched the swamp high and low all night long. And, um, you know, my cousin Anthony and I thought, and my brother-in-law, we thought that we were going to get interviewed the next day because this was such a big deal, you know, and we were seeing um, articles and stuff all all summer long in the newspaper and in and then on the news and TV, and but no one ever came to the house to ask us about it. We were like really the only witnesses other than the, the deputy, and uh, so I don't know what they did if they covered it up or how or what happened, but they never found they never found the skunk cave. Okay, and then um, there was a part of the swamp where we used to go ride our dirt bikes and have our bonfires. There was a part of the swamp that the local kids called the turnaround. They said the water would come in, turn around and go back out. Now these kids, the local guys would swim in the swamp. There are alligators in the swamp. Okay. Okay. Al, Al. Okay. Before we get into another story, you need to breathe a little bit. Serious. I don't know what to tell you. Take a few deep breaths before we go on the rest of this. I'm just being You're me. literally so, I can see it in you. You're just so, the story obviously is intense. It's an, I, I need to breathe. <laughs> I've been holding my breath for the last 15 minutes here. <laughs> I don't know what to, say, what to tell you. This is just, this is just how I am. This is a crazy, this is, this is when crazy. I, when I, when well, let's I, go back. Let's go back to the bull. Okay. Real, um, real. Did you see the head too? Also, did you? See oh yeah, it? absolutely. Of course, I was there. Yeah. Was it. was it? Did this thing get twisted? Do you think? Twisted. It looks. Off? Yeah, it looks like to me it was twisted and ripped off. Yeah. 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 There was like all <sighs> kinds of, uh, um, you know, stuff hanging out of it. Yeah, it was pretty nasty. So yeah, I mean, I, I hear about them tearing dogs in two. Yeah. I witnessed. A coyote getting its spine broken um, after we had already come through. Now, by the way, that coyote was still alive. Yeah, it was conscious and blinking its, but it was paralyzed. That doesn't no blood on it, just those two big handprints. And I video, I still have that. I've got the videotape of the coyote um, and that whole scene. But um, but and I've heard of like coyotes getting turned inside out like inside out and dogs inside out think about the force that it would take to turn a you know 60 pound dog inside out yeah no i mean i can't even i can't even picture that yeah what type of complete off the chart strength to kill a bull i mean to break its neck let alone to do what you just said 
decapitated it. That's yeah, that was insane. Yeah, just it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, was the sheriff like freaked, like freak, freak, freaked out? Well, that's what the yeah, I mean, that's when the sheriff said, okay, obviously, because you know, it's this is a little town. It's got the two cops, the sheriff and the deputy. That's it. You know, yeah. it's like um, you know Mayberry. You know, and. Uh, so he was calling in reinforcements. I mean, this, like I said, the county police rolled in, and they they came, and then the state states came, and they had the dogs and the horses and the helicopters, you know, and they were um, they searched high and low, but they couldn't find they couldn't find anything once they got into the swamp. Gosh, okay. So you got you got enough oxygen in you now, Al, to go to the next part here. <laughs> yeah. Alex, Alex <laughs> needed to breathe too. I was worried about him. <laughs> He was starting to turn purple. Well, let's just say, uh, you know, I'm glad I don't have to take the trash out. Tonight. No, actually, you know what? It all got done. I got a text. It's all done. I'm good to go. I can get as freaked out as I want. Okay. Anyhow, go ahead, Al. So, you know, there was a, this this part of the swamp that was called the turnaround, and the, and yep. the local kids would swim in it. And they wanted us, me and my cousin, to swim in. And I was like, no, I'm not going in this. I'm not going in the turnaround. You know what I mean? There's water moccasins in there. There's alligators. Yeah. You know? And they would say, no, the alligators, they don't come to the, to the end of the turnaround. They don't come to, to the end of the canals for some reason. They just don't come this far up. And I was like, didn't make any sense to me. There's fish in there and there's frogs and there's turtles. And why wouldn't the alligators come to that? End of the yeah, swamp? I wouldn't, I wouldn't swim in there. No, but I'm, but these kids did. And, um, one, mm. one, one day my cousin Anthony and I are sitting on the banks fishing into the turnaround and we see an alligator floating in. It's asleep and it's just floating in with the tide. And I swear to God, when it woke up and it seen where it was, it like its eyes went like this and it ran on top of the water to get out of the turnaround. It ran and like with my cousin Nancy and I, we just looked at each other like, did we just see that? We just seen an alligator run on, on, on water. I mean, that's how fast its legs were moving. And we couldn't understand it, you know? And my friend, one of my friends, like a kid my age, 12 years old, um, said he believes that he believed he had a theory that the skunk apes lived in um, ta uh, caverns under the water, you know, and he thought they lived in, in the ever in, in the swamps. And he says that's why once they get in here, no one ever finds them. So he says I'm gonna go swimming along the banks of around the cattails. Why don't you come with me? We'll look for a cavern. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna come with you because you're gonna end up you know, coming up on an alligator den and a mother alligator is going to eat you, you know? And he's like, no, no. Um, and he's diving down and he's messing around and he's in the water for like an hour. And then all of a sudden he, he pops up and he's like, dude, I found something. It's a, a, like 10 feet under the water. It's a cavern. It goes in. I'm going in. And I'm like, dude, don't go in there. You know, he's like, I'm going in. I was like, dude, it's an alligator den. Don't go in there. You're going to get killed. And he goes, no, I'm going in. He goes, um, if I'm not back in five minutes, go to my house to get my brothers. Okay. He swims into this canal, underground canal, cavern, whatever it was. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, five minutes have gone by. Maybe I should go get his brothers. And she says, I'm about to take off the his brothers. He pops up. He comes out of the water and he's super hyper. If you think I was very hyper tonight, he just that blue would blow me away. Yeah. And he's bouncing off the wall and he stinks to high heaven. He smells exactly like what we smelled walk past the house one night. And he's bouncing off the walls and he's jumping up and down. He's like, I found it, I found it, I found it. It's an underground canal. You come up under the water and there's a cavern that opens up into a cavern and there's all these caves and I think the, uh, the skunk apes live in these caves and he's going on and on and on. He's just bouncing off that I'm trying to hold him down yeah. and he wants me to go in with him. To see Hell this. No. And, I, and I tell the kid, I go, dude, think about this. I said, just think about what you, you I said, what would your father do if he woke up in the middle of the night and found somebody in his house 
he would probably just shoot him and ask questions later. I said, what do you think these creatures are going to do if this is truly their lair and you pop your head up out of the water? They're going to pop your head off like they did to that bull. And I said, I'm not going in there, you know? Well, that whole area, that whole area, Al, is all limestone. And yeah, there are lots of uh, dried up aquifers, caverns, caves everywhere down there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure there was. And uh, so then he comes out and he settles down. I got him on the banks when he's settling down. And he's like, okay, listen, we got to, you got to make a deal with me. And I was like, what's that? And he says, you can't tell anybody about this because if you tell anybody about it, then the sheriff is going to come back and they're going to, you know, blow the, blow all these caverns up. And, you know, this is where we hang out anyway. They're going to destroy this area. So, um, you know, please don't tell anybody about it. He goes, not even your cousin, you know? And I was like, fine, I won't tell anybody about it. You know, my lips are sealed. Um, so then, like, the end of the summer rolls around, and we're getting ready to come back to New York, and I'm telling my cousin, man, I can't wait to get back to tell my brother, who's, like, one of the first parapsychologists in the United States at the time, and I'm like, I can't wait to tell my brother, and he's like, oh, you can't tell anybody, and I'm like, what do you mean I can't tell anybody? He goes, if you tell people, um, you know, we're, we're going to be ridiculed, and my family, the way my family shows love is by breaking your chops, okay? And the more they break your chops, the more you love. And my cousin didn't want to be ridiculed. And he was a big guy. A 15-year-old kid, he had a back that was like this. And uh, he was like, if I if you tell anybody and they start breaking our chops, I'm going to I'm gonna kick your ass, you know? And I didn't want to get my ass kicked by my cousin. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So when we got back to New York, I did tell like my two closest friends who knew my cousin. I said, whatever you do, don't tell Anthony because he'll kick your ass too, you know? And um, so I never told anybody about it. And then like 30, 40 years later, my brother writes a book and he calls my sister and she says, you should call your brother and uh, talk to him. He's the one with all the experiences, you know? So my brother calls me and I tell him, I gave him like, I don't know, a UFO experience and a ghost experience and a Bigfoot experience to put in his book. And so I tell him about this and he's like, okay. So he calls my sister to validate it. And my sister says, oh yeah, I remember that summer. That was crazy, you know? And, but my brother-in-law and my cousin had passed by then, you know? And I had never really told anybody about it you know, after my two closest friends, I never told anybody about it. But I remember my sister calling us when we got back to New York because on the other side of the canal was another horse farm that belonged to my brother-in-law's best friend, Ralph. And when we were when we were back in New York, the, the skunk ape went into Ralph's, um, not Ralph's, um, his stables he broke they broke into the stables and it took a pony and when it broke into the stables it must have stepped on a nail or something it cut itself um so when ralph heard all the commotion he went out and he started shooting at it and him and his ranch hands they all got on horses and, and they got their guns and they were going after this thing they were going to kill it you know by the time they caught up to it, and they were following the blood trail by the time they caught up to it it had already dove into the canal and swam off, but they found the pony. The pony's neck was broke, and it was just it was just carrying the pony nice. all under its arm. Mm. Yeah. So. Um, okay. All right. We got to back up just a little bit. I have, <laughs> got a few questions. I'm sure you're not even done. I don't. I have no idea. No, that's. I mean, that's that's it for that's it for the skunk ape story down in Florida. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you describe a little more what it looked like when you first saw this thing? Yeah, I, I mean, mean, was the fur? Let me tell even even the hair condition. It, the hair, like I said, the hair was black. It was it wasn't so thick that you couldn't see the skin underneath it. You know what I mean? Like you could see with the sensor lights, you could see the yeah. the like the skin. Its face was almost like um uh, a grayish. Um, leathery kind of looking face, like a worn out black leather gloves kind of face. I look grayish. 
It definitely had the canine. Now, the eyes were red, but I'm not sure if that had to do with the reflection of the sensor lights in its eyes or what. You know what I mean? It did have the conical head. Arms were very long and muscular. It had big arms and a big... It's just. It looked like its chest was as thick as it was wide. And it was minimum of four feet wide the shoulders you know well it must have been awful big to kill that bull yeah yeah like i said my rule of thumb is 100 pounds per foot so if this thing was nine feet tall and it was a minimum of 900 pounds i'm yeah. sure i'm sure i'm i'm light too you know what i mean when i say that i, I weigh 150 pounds per foot <laughs> <laughs> so you're two feet tall. <laughs> Alex, but, uh, um, I'm, okay, so let's say I got to get Alex's reaction here. What are your thoughts on hearing this story? It's the craziest one wig we've heard, isn't it? I just, yeah, I mean, especially the the bull with the the bull's head being ripped off. I mean, oh my god. Yeah. yeah, and I can't emphasize enough how big this bull was. When I tell you it was the size of a minivan. Yeah, this what what year the, what year was this, John? Nineteen seventy four. Yeah, so it's such a back time. So how yeah. how big do you think that that skunk ape was? Oh, nine uh, feet. I think it was nine because like I said that I know that I know that the fence that was in the backyard was six foot tall to keep the dogs in. And it was head and shoulders above the fence. I would say minimum of three feet, you know? It looked like three feet to me, you know? Above the fence. Yeah, above the fence. Three feet above the fence, you know? Um, was its hair matted, clean? No, it definitely wasn't clean. It, 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 if, I wouldn't say it was matted. But it wasn't clean. Absolutely not. No. Would you say this is a good depiction? Yeah, that that's what that's what it looked like. Only the only thing is in this in this uh, depiction, um, I told Sevilla, but it, I guess it was too late to make his arms longer. His arms mm. are definitely longer than that. Yeah. So they did they reach past his knees? Yeah, they definitely went down. To, to his like his wrists were down by the knees. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But the rest is super accurate, huh? Yeah, you know, and if I remember correctly, and I kind of got a picture of it in my head, I think the lower legs were longer than the upper legs, I think, you know. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was a big boy. It was definitely a big boy. You know, I didn't see any genitals or anything like that because I was locked in to its face. I couldn't get past its chest and its face. Like, I was just, like I said, my cousin and I, we both worked out. I did martial arts my whole life. I trained and trained and trained. And we, my cousin was a weightlifter. He was, he was like a big, bulky kid for 15. He was huge. And I couldn't get over how wide and how thick it was, you know? I swear, it felt like it was four feet thick and four feet wide. Well, why, yeah, they do always say, you know, not not always, but, you know, you do hear stories also of them being kind of lanky and smaller, but that could also, those reports could be from a young juvenile that was, you know, running around and being seen by a bunch of people, and, you know, we don't really know anything. But I have talked to witnesses personally from down there that have also said they were massive, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this guy was definitely, he was definitely an alpha. He well, wasn't, what, yeah. what, what part, I mean, can you be more specific on what area this was? It you was say this, it was in Florida, but where? South most? Florida. The town was called Davie, Florida. Davie, um, Florida. It was okay. just, uh, it was uh, like on the outskirts of Fort Lauderdale. Okay, and, sure. And it was uh, another, the town next to us was called um, Cooper City. And, and so, it's, so it's north of Miami, but. Yeah, so, it's north of Miami. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and back so, in 74, Florida was a whole lot more wild than it is now. It was, a, it was still a cowboy town. Oh, God, you know? yes. Yeah, it was, like I said, 
every pickup truck had three rifles in the window, you know, yeah. and everybody had cowboy hats and cowboy boots and the, the streets in Davie itself, the town itself, there were no sidewalks, you know. What have, I mean? you, have you done research on what the town in the area looks like today? Yeah, oh, it's all developed now. The swamp, the swamp is the the Sunshine Acres. The cattle ranch is gone. The horse ranch is gone. It's yeah. all homes. They 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 drain the swamps. They yeah. built more homes. It's, according to my sister, it's really like a a high end um, suburb now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately, um, the wilderness in Florida is shrinking because of the huge growth they've had. Um, it's such a, a, it was just, I used to go to Florida in the 80s a lot, early 80s, not yeah, actually the late 70s. I used to go down there <clears throat> quite often. Sometimes I would go every weekend. Yeah. I would just get in my car and just in the wintertime and just book down there because my brother lived down there and um, just drive through the night, and, you know, just really fast too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, yeah. um, okay, so that establishes that. Did you um, feel maybe less traumatized because you were a child, you know, younger? No, I was traumatized for years. You yeah. were? Okay. Yeah, like um, when, when we got back to the city, uh, my bedroom was like the size of a prison cell. It used to be like a front porch. And my father was a carpenter mm -hmm. and he closed it off to make a, another bedroom for me, you know? And the only windows he had in his carpenter shop was a big picture window with little windows on the side. And our front lawn was like a postage stamp, even smaller than that, you know, just a little bit of hedges, some flowers from my mother and a little bit of grass. And, I used to think that this thing was going to step over into that lawn mm -hmm. and reach through that picture window and its arms were so long and the, and the bedroom was so short. I mean, it was five feet wide. It was wide, wide. And I used to think it was going to grab me and pull me right out of the bed and take me for, for a, I would say at least two years I was traumatized okay. by it. Yeah. Well, sometimes kids are either more traumatized or less because they have less of a paradigm. You know they're not, they're not growing up their whole life thinking that monsters are not real. Uh, maybe kids are just like, oh, that's just normal life. But in you, your case, you were it scared the living bejesus. Yeah, we, you know, in me and my friends, um, even though we lived in the city, we we our playground was a park called Van Cortlandt Park Woods. It was like fifteen hundred acres of woods that the Van Cortlandt family donated to the city of New York. It's in the Bronx. They had stables down there with horses in the yeah. whole nine yards. And uh, we lived in those woods. You know what I mean? We, we knew those woods like the back of our hands. And it was hard for me to go back down into those woods, you know, like I, and like during the day it was okay. But once it started, the sun started to go down. There was no hanging out in the woods at night anymore for bonfires. Yeah. You know, I had to be like, in the in the city in the park or something like that i didn't want to be and i had woods like right behind my house there was woods directly behind my home you know um, there was also yeah. a park directly behind mm -hmm. it but we was we were like surrounded by woods and and it, one, our woods led into the van Cortland woods and uh yeah no it was it was tough man when it got dark at night i mean not that my father allowed me to stay out once it got dark he would whistle like a dog and i'd come running in from the woods you know what i mean but um not that i wanted to be in there after dark anyway you know so um how much damage was on this police car oh that, that police car looked like it hit a, it hit it hit an oak tree yeah it was it was pretty like I said, they had to take it out with a tow truck. You couldn't drive it out of there. Wow. Yeah. And so you saw did you see it run out and and smack that car? Or was your vision blocked? I kind of seen it with like my peripheral vision, you know, like I seen movement and then bang, I heard the bang and I turned my head. And as I turned my head, I seen the creature stumble back. It hit the the school bus sign, take that sign down. Because I remember 
the following day when the town came out to replace that sign. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually was curious enough to ask the guys, like, you know, how difficult it is it to bend one of these signs, you know, and then, and the guy said, no, oh, these things can take like 250 mile an hour winds before they bend, you know? He well, goes, how, how smashed was it? Was it like flattened on the ground? No, it was, it was like if you grabbed, um, say it was a triangle shaped sign, right? You yeah. grabbed the two points on the outside and you just push them in and it was bent like that. Oh, the actual sign was damn. Yeah, the not sign. The pole. The, oh, the, pole, pole. the pole went down, yeah. But, oh, I mean, oh, the, the pole went down and yeah. the sign was smashed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's a hell of a thing. Yeah, that would take some force. I believe they're aluminum, but yeah, they can they can withstand. Yeah, I don't, force you know, I don't know what they're made out of, but I remember it telling the guy. The know, pole is steel, but the sign, I, or maybe it's not aluminum. Alex, can you Google that? Are street signs, are they aluminum or are they steel? Maybe they are steel. Yeah, I bet you they are. Yeah, I think Why would are. they make them out of aluminum? Steel is cheaper. Oh, it has been. But, um, yeah, no. I aluminum. Remember, yeah. Oh, they are aluminum. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, so I don't you know, know what they were made out of in 74, but I mean, uh, like I said, I asked the guy, you know, just out of curiosity. I don't know why he did, but this was going on in my head. Like, how how difficult is it to bend one of these things? He was like, no, these things can tip up stand like 250 mile hour winds, hurricane winds. That's what they build them in Florida yeah. to take those hurricane winds, you know? And, oh, God, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's flash forward now to a more recent experience. Um, maybe you've got one that you want to share. I know you do research. I'm sure I'm, I'm assuming you've had some other experiences with Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming. Uh, I've had a few. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I really, I mean, this is all kind of fresh to me. Um, uh, so go ahead and jump flash forward to, a another, uh, encounter story. Okay. So, um, God, I don't remember what year it was. 2006. 12 maybe i don't know i don't remember we were i had um we're going out investigating with a bunch of friends of mine at work and we were we had done a little research of uh, this area uh, that where the appalachian trail ran through and there was a lot of uh bigfoot sightings on this appalachian trail so we decided to go one saturday and and just take a look and as we're walking up uh, the mine there was a mining road that turned into the, to like a, a goat trail but the Appalachian Trail ran through this area and we came across a, a deer carcass full deer it had it had to be 170 pounds 75 pounds if it weighed an ounce and it was up in the fork of a tree about 60 feet straight up and this tree was shaped like a fireman's pole. There was no branches where you can go from one branch to the other to climb up. Whatever carried this deer up this tree shimmied straight up it. And I remember we were all taking pictures of it and looking at it. And it was pretty wild. You know, we blew our minds. And then as we went further into the woods, we came across a TP structure okay. that had um, logs, I would say, the circumference of like eight inch circumference logs that were woven into each other. Yeah. And I was trying to get one of my friends to go inside so I could get a photograph of him inside it, you know, but nobody would go in. But so I said, I went in. I said, okay, then I'm going in. And I went in and I seen how everything was set up. And I was like, you know, a person didn't build this because you can't manipulate these logs like this. You know what I mean? It's tough enough to manipulate a stick that's two inches in circumference, never mind something that's eight. And then we went deeper into the woods and we exactly. found these, we found these little stone cairns up on like cliff faces. Like, and I'm thinking, you know, at first it freaked me out. I'd be brutally honest. I, I got like a Blair Witch kind of thing going, you know, it freaked me out. And uh, I because I, I never knew what they were. I didn't know what they were. And I was like, who built these things? You have to climb up a cliff face straight up to, to build them on the edge of a cliff. 
I mean, you have to be a billy goat to get up there. And then who's carrying rocks up there with them? So that led to um, a second investigation at night. But on the second investigation, we decided instead of taking the mining road in, we were going to take the Appalachian Trail Road in. And I had done a little um, pre-investigation, scouting out the trail. And there were two trails, one that went up and one that went down. And I decided this particular night we were going to do, we were going to take the upper trail. So we were hiking up the trail and it was about eight of us. And, um, you know, uh, all my friends are from the city. They're not used to being in the woods at night, at dark. It was 1% of the moon that night. So it was a really, really dark night. And I was leading the trail and uh, I had another guy, this guy, Anthony, he was in the back. He was like my, one of the guys who were one of the most experienced investigators on, in the group. Mm -hmm. And this other kid, O'Neill, he was up front with me. And as we were, were hiking up this cliff face, um, we're going up, to, we're going up this little go trail. We're going up, we're going up, we're going up. And we stopped for, for a minute to take a break. And a smell, that same smell that I smelled down in Florida came up out of the holler. And I didn't say anything to anybody because I didn't want to freak anybody out because the trail was so narrow. It was such a treacherous trail. If these guys would have tried to run out of it, they would have killed themselves. So I just said to myself, okay, you know, be cool. I won't say nothing to nobody. And Anthony came up from behind me at the end of it. He says, Al, I think we're being followed, man. He says, um, I think there's something down in the hollow or parallel in us. You know, I see, I hear something following us. And I was like, okay, you know. And then O'Neill came over to me and he says, Al, I think there's something above us on the ridge line parallel in us as well. We're being paralleled on both sides. So we had like a million luma uh, spotlight with us that night. And we were looking for eye shine up on the high, high ridge above us to our west. And there was nothing there. And we were looking down in the holler with it. And um, we didn't find any eye shine. And I do, we did have, we did have like um, night vision goggles and we looked with the night vision goggles and we didn't see anything. So I said, well, you know what? And I, and I noticed right where we stopped, we were underneath the tree structure. And I was like, I didn't get, I didn't say nothing to anybody because I didn't want to freak these guys out. But we were underneath the tree structure where we stopped for a break to get water because we were about, maybe three miles in at that point, you know, and it was like all uphill. And uh, so we, we keep going and we're, now we go down, we go down, we come down the, off the trail and we end up in the swamp. We're in a swamp and there's a pack of coyotes, large pack of coyotes. I would say it seemed like there was a dozen of them if there was one. And there we yip in and they're going crazy and they're running all around us, but they're staying away from us, but we can hear them running and they're running all around us in circles. And, you know, everybody, all oh, my friends are getting all nervous. And I'm saying, listen, just calm down. They're not going to mess with us. You know, we're bigger than them and yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. Whatever was in the holler came racing out of the holler screaming at the top of its lungs and when it screamed we were getting hit with sound waves that were going through our body like it was knocking us back i could feel the fluid in my body vibrating and then whatever was up on the ridge came charging down and it screamed and then it started it started killing the coyotes they were grabbing the coyotes and smashing them against the trees and snapping them in half. Jeez. You can hear them hitting the rocks. And my friends take off in every direction. I'm telling them, don't run, don't run, don't run. They take off and just everybody's running south because south is where the road is. That's where our car is parked at the head, trailhead. And everybody's running. And I'm not running. I'm staying there. I'm standing my ground when... I see a coyote running right towards me. It's the size of a German Shepherd. 
okay? And it, But it's not looking at me. It's looking behind it. It's like something's chasing it, and it runs into me, and it hits me, and it sends me flying into this tree, and I dislocate my shoulder. Okay, can we stop right here? Jesus. Al. <laughs> Okay, first you need to breathe. We all need to breathe. Okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath, Al. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So you just got whacked with a coyote. You're hearing coyotes getting killed. 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 How do you know they were being killed? I mean, they're... Because you can hear them being bounced off trees literally like something had it by the tail and was spinning it around and they're quite noisy it. so what yeah. i would imagine they were screaming oh my god the woods came alive like it was the end of the world yeah uh it, between the sasquatches screaming and the coyotes screaming and yipping, and they're running for their lives, and they're running in all different directions. The coyotes are just running in all different directions. How many do you think there were? How many coyotes were there? I would say, I, I feel it was like a large a large pack. I would say about 10 or 12 for sure. It was a okay. big pack, yeah. Okay. Um, so they're freaked out. Um, you think some of it were killed. No, I believe they were definitely killed. And they were definitely killed. And one hits you. Oh, uh, yeah, that's why I kind of needed to breathe right it, there. It really this this coyote did not even see me because I had my head lamp on and I seen it running towards me. But I never thought in a million years it was going to run into me. You know, I thought it was going to dodge me, so I stayed still. And but it was it was looking over its shoulder, running away, and it hit me head on and set me flying i'm a Gosh. big dude and when i hit that tree and i felt my shoulder come out i was like oh man i was in so much pain and all my friends were gone and here i am in the middle of all this craziness and i gotta get up against the tree and put my shoulder against the tree and snap it back into place which was no easy feat and I get it back into place and I start heading out towards I'm now I'm heading south towards the street as well. I know we got at least three miles to go before I get to the main road and then another mile up to the trailhead. And I come across a, a young couple's sleeping on the Appalachian Trail in the tents, but they were off trail, you know, they were far enough in the woods and I just happened to stumble across and nobody knew they were there. And the, the dude came out of the tent and he's like, what's going on? And I was like, the coyotes are going crazy. Stay in your tent. You're fine. Don't come out of your tent until the sun comes up. You'll be okay. You know, I said, the coyotes are going crazy. I didn't tell them about the Sasquatches. I just said, stay in your tent. <laughs> and I hiked out, I got back up to the trailhead. Everybody made it out okay in one piece. We got in our cars, and when I reached out to grab the door to my Jeep to close the door, to pull the door closed, my shoulder came out again. And I had to snap it back in against the car seat. So when I got home at 2 o'clock in the morning, I had to wake my wife up out of a dead sleep and say, listen, can you drive me to the emergency room? Because I dislocated my shoulder. And she wasn't happy about that at all. And, uh, but my friends never went back into those woods again, but I, you know, that's one of my hot spots. Alex, can you handle the rest of this interview on your own? I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Okay. <clears throat> so the, I mean, coyotes are, are very wary, obviously. So it was obviously freaked out. It didn't give a damn about you. It didn't even see me. It was it running for its life. Oh. Yeah, it was running for its Because when we were going up the trailhead, uh, up the Appalachian Trail, we were going up the, we could hear the coyotes below us down in the swamp hunting, you know, yipping and hunting. And I honestly, I think, not that I don't, I, it's, again, one man's opinion. I believe the Sasquatch were following the coyotes 
you know, not to hunt them, but just follow No, I, I think there's a symbiotic relationship there. Yeah, too. I think they were following them. Maybe you know, okay. The coyotes would well, let's let's talk about coyotes and Bigfoot for a minute. Um, I mean, early man, we tamed the wolf. You know, that's how domestic dogs are, exist. Even if they just have a, um, you know, I'm not talking every, I believe that Bigfoots may even attack rival packs of their pack that they deal with. Does that make sense? Maybe. If they're territorial, absolutely. Yeah, because coyotes are very territorial. I'll have yeah. a pack of 12 here and a pack of 12. I've seen evidence because when i mentioned mass destruction of a pack there would be no reason to do that because i really do believe coyotes would help a bigfoot find food because coyotes are kind of omnivorous i mean they eat anything yeah they'll eat meat they eat fruit they'll eat berries they'll eat anything mm -hmm. you know birds and frogs yeah and absolutely they're the most unpicky and i think bigfoots are omnivorous so why not, even if they're not buds with the coyotes, maybe coyotes are just used enough where they're in within arm's reach, let's say. Because the thing that happened to us, that coyote must have been right within arm's reach. It didn't like go out and try to hunt a coyote. I think that coyote was sitting right next to it when it grabbed it and said, snap, and threw it out on the trail to intimidate us. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I even think they're capable of obviously killing their own, their own pack. I mean, for lack of a better description, but there's got to be some symbiotic relationship there. So you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think, I think the, and again, just one man's opinion. I think the two Sasquatches, the one down in the hall and the one on the upper uh, ridge line, were following the coyotes because if the coyotes would have spook a deer out of its hiding spot, it would run right into them. You know what I mean? And then they would kill that deer and take the deer, you know? Yeah. Is it also possible that they knew you were you guys were there and it did that to those coyotes to intimidate you? Oh, it did that to those coyotes because we were in between them and they were not happy. That's what I mean. Let's say yeah, you guys wouldn't have been there would. that night. Is it yeah, possible? No, yeah, I don't think they would have killed the coyotes. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's yeah. what I'm getting at. We yeah. were definitely in between the the one on the ridge and the one in the holler, and they were so frustrated with us being in the way because you know we we t we're telling each other something's paralleling us. Maybe they think we were paralleling <clears throat> them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or everybody was just going north at the same time. And I think they were frustrated. Well, I, I have a firsthand experience. I didn't see anything, but I was up um, grouse hunting up in uh, Canada or on the border of Canada. Maybe I was in Canada. I can't really remember. But anyhow, I um, uh, one night heard a pack of wolves, timber wolves, running through our camp. You could hear them panting and running one after another right through the camp. And then right behind it, I hear boom, 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 boom. And my cot that I'm on in the tent <laughs> is literally it's bouncing. Yeah. Because the ground up and up when you get really far up north, northern Minnesota, northern Canada, Canada, the ground is just hollow. And man, it vibrates if something runs. And then that thing ran right through the camp after those wolves. And so whether it was chasing the wolves or just following the wolves, I don't know. But there was definitely some relationship going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think I think we pissed them off enough that they took it out on the coyotes. To the big, I think they, they I think would, you're right there. I, I, I would they would have taken it out you. on us, and people would have found us, and you would have had search parties it's kind of like in. see okay it's kind of like okay guys humans look what we'll do to our own buds <laughs> yeah. or look what we'll do to look what we can do to a coyote you better get out of here yeah yeah and i've and you know uh put it this way i've only been back in that in that particular swamp once or twice because you know uh the ones the sasquatch that were there that night were not happy with us and, you know, 
Um, and we were just trying to get to and from point A to point B, we were just taking the long way in, you know? Gosh. And uh, we got in between them. Like I said, it was 1% of the moon. So it was dark that night. Even with the headlamps on, it was dark, you dark, know? Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. So do you have another encounter that you want to tell us? And then we're going to probably be out of time. Then we're going to have to cut it off. We'll have to get you back if you've got more. I'm sure you have... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got tons of experiences. Um, I mean, I've, um, we, I was driving home one night on the park, one day on the parkway. It had rained in the morning, and I was visiting a relative. And I, after having coffee and cake, I was on my way home, and I got stuck in traffic. They were doing construction on the road, and right to my to my left is a cutout where the power lines are. And um, I always look up there and I never see anything. But this particular day, I looked and there on top of a, a giant stone was, a, again, a very, very tall, huge Sasquatch. I don't know if he was sunning himself to try to dry himself from the rain or what, but it was sitting on a rock. And it was looking down at the parkway. And I don't know if it was watching. It, it was uh, fascinating with the construction workers or what. But I remember calling my partner up and saying, dude, I'm looking at a Bigfoot right now at the power lines. And he's like, oh, you got to go. up, You got to turn around. You got to go. You got to go there. And I said, I can't turn around because they got the parkway closed off for construction. So I went back. We went back like uh, a couple of days later. And we went up to, to the, where the power line was, and we found what looked like um, the Sasquatch may have been sleeping underneath that big rock because the tall grass was pushed down. And it may have been using that rock for shelter, whether it was for the rain or the, the wind at night or whatever. And then it was, and then we went further up the hill and, um, we found what looked like a knee impression in the ground and a fist impression. We took photographs of it. And uh, then we found like all kinds of, the deeper we kept going into the woods, the more stuff we found. We found all kinds of bends and breaks and twists and stuff. But we came across a lot of glyphs that day. And the glyphs were down in a gully. You would, if you didn't go down in the gully, you wouldn't have seen them. And something was pulling me towards that gully. When sometimes when I go out, I get pulled in certain locations. And something was pulling me towards that gully. When we got to the gully, there was a big tree knocked down across it, like a, like a bridge kind of thing. And my partner says, I'm going to go across the tree to get to the other side and see what's on the other side. And I said, okay, I'm going to go down in the gully because I feel like I need to go down. In the and we found all these glyphs and we took all these pictures and just one thing led to another, to another, to another. And when we finally got to the, the, where the power lines, the actual power lines were down at the base of the power lines where the concrete were, um, there were again, these little stone Karens that something had put at the bottom of the power lines, you know, made out of stones on the concrete block that the power lines were uh, put into. And um, but are, was, you, are you, let me interrupt you for one second, just so our audience knows that you're talking about stacked rocks, right? Yeah, stacked rocks, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, continued. Yeah, no, so we felt like it was weird because one thing would lead to another, to another, to another. And the further we went, we went, we went. And then, uh, you know, of course, we didn't travel the power lines all the way north because they went up a giant mountain and everything. But we, we did follow it for uh, maybe a half a mile or so. And, you know, again, it was just every time we would go somewhere, we would find more sign, whether it was a break, a bend, an arch, an X a twist whatever um and then to the right whether we go whether we went east or we went west we would find more signs and um and it was just you know it was it was weird how this gully ran a, a, inside the wood line along almost like it paralleled the road 
And if something was walking in that gully, uh, something big could probably walk along that road and behind that power line and never be seen from the street. You know what I mean? And uh, it was just, you know, a wild, a wild uh, experience to see something like that. You know, it's just to, it's it's funny how one thing leads to another, you know, and sometimes you could be at a location for hours and look around and not see nothing. And then all of a sudden it's like the veil is lifted and everything that you didn't see the whole time you were there, you're seeing left and right now. And you're trying to, and you don't know why you, it took you two hours to see this stuff when it's been right in front of your eyes for an hour. It's where sometimes it's like there's a veil over your eyes and you don't see stuff. And then boom, the veil is lifted and there's, stuff right in front of you everywhere you look it's weird just for you and like i said i get pulled i get pulled in directions when i go someplace you know and i go where i'm being pulled so if i'm being pulled off trails one way or the other i have to go because there's a reason i'm being pulled that way i may not know what it is but i know there's a reason for it so you know and uh, again this particular parkway I did a lot of commuting on for 32 years and it seemed like I was always on it when it was dark. When I go to work in the morning, it was dark. When I came home at night, it was dark. And there was another time I was coming around a turn and it was, it was very, very foggy. And I see these two red look like lights looking at me and I'm quarter mile away and I can't figure out what I'm looking at. And I'm going slow because it's like a really treacherous road and mountain road. And I'm looking at this stuff and I'm trying to figure out what I'm looking at. And as I start to get closer to these two red lights, that's what I'm thinking they're lights. I see a white Sasquatch on the side of the road. And he's got one foot up on the embankment and his hand against a tree and he's looking at me and it looks like he's getting ready to run across the parkway. And I'm slowing down because I don't want to hit this thing. It's going to total my Jeep. You know what I mean? And I'm slowing down. A good thing it was like 4.30 in the morning. I was the only person on the road. And I'm slowing down and waiting for it to run across. But it never ran across. And my windows were tinted on the Jeep. So I pulled the windows down to get a better look. And just this giant white it had to be 10 feet tall it was huge standing there looking at me just looked me dead in the eyes and I looked at it and it was like it felt like it wanted to say something to me you know what I mean like what's you know like and then as I went past it I tapped the brakes to see if it would go across the road, you know, so I could light up the, the road behind me. And when I tapped the brakes, it actually ran across the road at that point. It, it had waited for me to pass, you know, but I've heard so many stories where they wait for the car to get right up on them and then they run in front of the car, you know? So the last thing I wanted to do was crash it and crash into one. But like, yeah. I, not in a million years did I ever think that I would ever see a, a white Sasquatch, not in my wildest imaginations. And then there's one standing on the side of the road. I went back to that spot like 10 times to try to debunk it. Was it, was it an owl in a tree? Was it ice on the side of the mountain that was white? You know, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. And, None of that stuff was there. There was no ice on the mountain. There was no owls in the in the trees. It was what it was, you know. Gosh. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Well, we're gonna stop right there. Okay. Because it's a great cutoff point. We got to get you back on for part two. <laughs> if, you're, if you're if you're willing. Oh, of course, absolutely. Uh, yeah. No, it was it was your stories are heart stopping. Um, and I, I don't mean to use the word stories. I yeah, don't use the word encounters. Experience. I yeah, encounters say, are I always say insane. Oh, by um, the way, what kind of dirt bike did you have back then? Oh, back then we were riding, like, I think we were riding, like, Yamaha 75s or something oh, like okay. that. Yeah, yeah. 
They were they weren't they weren't big dirt bikes. They were those I little was, mini enduros. I, those little, they uh, weren't they weren't mini bikes. They were they were actually they looked like dirt bikes, but they were like my cousin's version was bigger than mine. So maybe he had a one twenty five, and I had a seventy five cc. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Got but they it. went, they went, they went fast as hell. They were, they, we moved on those bad boys. Yeah, there's nothing like um, uh, having the freedom of a dirt bike when you're a kid. It's amazing. And now Florida's break because everything is flat. So yeah, you can just yeah. go as fast as you want. Oh, that's you know? awesome. Yeah. Anyhow, so, um, thank you so much, Al. Thanks, no, Alex. Thank you for Thanks, Al. I know, I know yeah. Alex was a little. Frustrated, coming and going, coming and going with this software crashing. Yeah, yeah, it's been a real treat. <laughs> yeah, I hope I, I hope my end was good. No, no you were great. Was, great. Yeah. Okay, thank it's you. It's just yeah. something wrong. This new they they um, forced us on some new software, and it's just buggy. Yeah, I was I was so worried about my end because we're having terrible storms here in New York. Not oh yeah, only, you getting a lot of snow there? No, we're getting a lot of heavy rain and heavy, heavy winds, rain. And oh. damaging winds. Yeah, and I was like, oh God, please, please don't let it, you know, mess up my oh, wow. feed tonight. You know. Well, I I pray for you guys because the yeah. storm is really freaky. So yeah. So anyhow, everybody, please remember to acquire great knowledge takes. You study many, many, many things. You got to study books and all sorts of stuff. But just to gather wisdom, all you got to do is observe. That's it. So, with that, we'll talk to everybody next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Al. Hey, thank you. I call you up in the middle of the night. Been bothered by dreams, ain't feeling all right. You give me comfort, say just give it some time By the end of our talk